Well, hello everyone. This is Jeannie at Historic Sauterly with the big picture. Today we're going to talk about 1812 at Sauterly. Um, it wasn't raining until I set up and now it's sprinkling a little bit. So if I have to duck inside, I apologize for that. But I wanted you to look at this view. Um, this is, be I'm standing behind the barn facing um, on the overlook facing the slave cabin and the Patuxent River. So welcome everyone. Um, please comment, uh, talk to each other. I'm Jeannie Pirtle from Historic Sauterly. So we're going to get started. I'm hoping there's no downpour. This will be fine, but as I said, if I have to duck, I, I just do. But the birds are singing. It's just gorgeous out here. Um, so I, I wanted you to see it and maybe um, hear some of the noises out here. I hear some birds calling. Let me, um, I hope you can hear me. Can you all hear me? I hope so. Catherine Humphreys is going to give you um, some resources for this week and she's going to uh, help with uh, communicating with you all because I can't see the screen right now really unless I stand behind the scenery um, so this will be recorded if you need to go back if you miss something or you need to head out and you need to come back later that's perfectly fine please do so and share with uh, others and ask people to like our pages and our website okay that's always good to do. So my papers are getting raindrops on them. Hello everyone. Um, I am going to uh, start out by saying 1812 was a turning point in Soderley's history. Um, uh, the British declared war um, uh, and uh, the United States declared war and the British um, did a blockade of the Chesapeake Bay by February of 1813. Really, the people at Sodderley, the owners at Sodderley at the time, were uh, John Rousby Plater, uh, one of the brothers of uh, George Plater, was the guardian of George Plater the the fifth. George Plater the fourth had died and his wife, so he was the guardian and acting master of Sodderley uh, during the War of 1812. Now, the War of 1812 lasted <clears throat> uh, for three years, excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> lasted for three years. So most of the action really happened in the last part here at Sodderley about 1815. But um, John Rossby Plater did not, he was a Federalist, and he did not uh, want to declare war on Britain because he was doing fine, just thank you. Uh, he thought it would disrupt trade, which he was uh, very concerned about, and uh, he didn't believe that the U.S. forces at the time uh, were strong enough to protect uh, us down here in Southern Maryland. On those points, he was correct. They weren't strong enough to protect people in Southern Maryland a lot of the time. Many homes got burned. Um, but an important thing happened, except Soderley's, of course, a miracle. Uh, but at the same time, the British are pretty smart. They're going to use whatever tactic they know how to disrupt life here in uh, the early United States. And one of those ways to disrupt is to disrupt the labor force, to say to all enslaved of citizens of America at that time that uh, follow us and you will be free. Um, so that's, you know, not all of it is out of the kindness of their heart. A lot of it has to do with it's a way to disrupt the status quo but it was open to all people um, that um, 
all enslaved people, whole families took advantage of this uh, all over Maryland and St. Mary's County. Uh, what was valuable about the enslaved also to the British ships and the British forces uh, was their knowledge of the landscape. I mean, they knew all the back trails. They knew where everybody's stuff was. They knew where all the tobacco stores were. Um, they were an asset for sure to the British forces. But at Sod, and we're right across the uh, river, the Patuxent River from uh, uh, um, St. Leonard Creek, which is uh, one, where one of the naval skirmishes happened. Some people call it a battle. It's, it's kind of really a skirmish. Uh, and right across, you can see it from Soderley's Manor House. So they would be able, they were close to it. They would be able to see it. Um, they made several landings up here um, and uh, threatened uh, to burn things. And if they found out that you had militia, they would burn it. Uh, for some, some reason yet to be discovered, uh, they chose not to burn Soderley. John Rouseby Plater, of course, takes credit for that. But um, that is not, uh, you know, that's his story. Uh, that's his perspective and that's worth reading. Um, his perspective of how things went down. It gives you a, a whole picture. Um, Soderley's enslaved whole families left with the British. So at least 48 or 49 enslaved people. There's my air traffic too and the rain is getting harder. I'm so sorry. Um, the, the enslaved people at Soderley, I'll let it go by. The enslaved people at Soderley um, took this chance. I mean, they weren't necessarily stolen, <clears throat> as some people would interpret, from the British. They would, uh, you know, they went because they took a chance. Uh, a few did not go for various reasons, but remember we talked about people had different choices. They were in different situations. We made a whole film about the choice if you haven't seen that already. Um, so the, it was it was a time where, um, you know, that is like um, all your enslaved leaving like that in big numbers uh, really took a toll on uh, the last owner, Plater owner, as he then did not have the labor to work his land. So it got harder and harder. So he did sell Soderley by 1822 and the 1812 story is a big part of that. Um, I'll show you here. So I'll just turn the camera just a little bit. It is still raining a little bit, but here's a trail down here if you can see it. So these are the kind of trails, probably not this good, that the enslaved knew like the back of their hand because remember they're related to a lot of other people on other plantations and farms. And so they are sneaking off to go visit their relatives all the time. There, there's a lot of relatives. Um, so they know their way around St. Mary's County. So it was a big asset to the British. Um, so what happened to these people? Uh, John Rouseby Plater, of course, <clears throat> um, he would uh, apply for reparations for his lost property. And <clears throat> it, it is a fact that most of, of the research you do on enslaved has to do with property, money, um, real estate and that kind of thing because of course enslaved are considered property. John Rouseby Plater is supposed to be watching out for his nephew's interests. Um, so he puts in uh, all, he lists 
all the enslaved that uh, that he knows of that left Soderly with the British. And the British promised to pay reparations. Um, and this list we use because it, it's very detailed. It has names. And ironically, it, it, probably without some of these documents, we wouldn't know these people. I know, it's a strange world, isn't it? Um, but he left, the, these documents are left, and basically it's lists of who, uh, it says, a list containing the number, value, age, and sexes of Negroes seduced and carried away the property of John Rousey Plater by the commander of the British fleet laying in the Patuxent River, Maryland in the months of June, July, and September 1814 during the late war with Great Britain. So by 1814, by the, by the end of 1814, uh, this was a sworn out document by John Rousby Plater. Um, so here they are, and it lists their value. By, the, by now we're of course using dollars um, at, the, at the time. So um, it's 1814, but it, it, on some of these he leaves, he leaves a description of them on these. So Stephen Corsi, age 37. Abraham Wood, age 12. Jesse Wood, age 33. Crowley Young, age 18. John Young, age 14. Daniel Young, age 12. Henry Young, age 13. James Thomas, age 48. John Seeley, age 50. John Seeley Jr., 17. It says he's a house servant. William Hammer, 12 years old. Isaac Hammer, 9 years old. Matthew Corsi, 8 years old. James, and it doesn't give a last name. Probably it was illeg illegible, but it's probably Corsi also, age 6. Uh, Benjamin uh, Seeley. Francis Hammer, Prince Young, Peter Campbell, so Prince Young is 60, Peter Campbell 55, Lewis Monroe 26, he's also a house servant, Gerald Monroe 14, Richard Monroe 5, Lewis Monroe 3, and here's the women and children, I guess they didn't uh, it says, I just, I guess they didn't count the male as young people as children. I don't know. Uh, Sarah Corsi, 40. Maria Seely, 44. Uh, someone with the last name Hammer, uh, a woman, 28. Sophia Seely, 15. Maria Seely, 17. Frankie Seely, 20. Maria Wood, 10. Honey Williams, 50. Mary Young, called Molly, 35. Catherine Young, 20. Elizabeth Hammer, 18. Tenny Merritt, 46, a good cook, and we have stories about Tenny. Louisa Thomas, age one. Mary Hammer, one. Patty Seely, one. Peggy Seely, eight. Esther Seely, four. Peggy Corsi, 14. Marianne Young, nine. Grace Monroe, a cook, 27. Esther Monroe, 7. And Kitty Monroe. Plus there's Peregrine Young, age 20, a most valuable servant. Ignatius Seeley, a blacksmith. James Bowie, Joseph Wood, and Cornelius. And it has a note here that he was last taken by Admiral Cockburn's fleet on the Potomac River in September or October. So all of these people listed on this document. Uh, and then if you dig deeper, you find out what happened to some of these people. I covered a little bit of this in my first uh, uh, episode of how we came about all this um, research in my first episode of The Big Picture, uh, but not in, in great detail. So uh, 
and then um, they have a list of slaves that's been carried off by British forces from the state of Maryland uh, claimants um, and it has it's a claimant document so a John Rousby Plater uh, he is listed as the claimant. So if you go on to your resources at Maryland State Archives link that I gave you, if you click on claimants, it'll John Rouseby Plater will show up also on there. And it lists uh, all these people once again, and it has how much they are worth at the time total, $15,930. Um, the average slave worth about $280 that would make the average value of the slaves. Um, so it's a lot of money to lose and it's a lot of property to lose. So um, the Treaty of Ghent was signed in December 1814, which ended the War of 1812 and it called for compensation for unreturned property. In 1818, the U.S. and Great Britain subject that issue and others to arbitration. Uh, in 1826, the British agreed to pay claims for slaves taken during the war and not returned. Um, so John Rouseby Plater did uh, receive reparations for all of these people. From the British so there you go um, so some of the stories that are connected with some of these people and we we can we do have stories about some of them more than others some of them we're still researching but the Corsi family and the Monroe family and the Seeley family they all made it uh, that those families not everyone in the family but they all they did make it to Halifax Nova Scotia so if anybody ever goes to Halifax Nova Scotia and goes to the archives look for this um, uh, there are still a lot of people named all these names Corsi Young Seeley and that's how I learned how to pronounce it right if I go to Canada they say Seeley um, so the all the when they got to uh, some of them died on ship like peregrine young and his uh, relative uh, crowley young died on ship on a british ship but a lot of them made it to halifax nova scotia now just because you are freed from slavery does not make racism go go away and discrimination so in canada uh, the the uh, the white Canadians there uh, in Halifax were not all too thrilled to have all these influx of former enslaved people coming into their uh, neighborhoods. There were neighborhoods set up. There's still neighborhoods that still exist with uh, that the these uh, ancestors of these people settled, but a lot of those are disappearing now under controversy. Uh, so, um, but uh, when they got there in 1815, um, life was tough. They weren't clothed for the weather. Uh, there was little supply. They were put in barracks that were not heated. So it was very rough. Uh, we know that the Corsi Seeley and Young fa and the Monroe family were given 10 acres of their own to farm and live on but it was not easy freedom was not easy um, and I've heard people when they discuss this oh well then they should have just stayed where they were and it would have been better oh really I bet some of you can give an argument to that um, no freedom is always better than enslavement um, and a lot of people are willing to pay whatever the cost for it. And as we should know as all Americans, but uh, somehow uh, the story gets skewed sometimes when it's told about the enslaved. So uh, they go up there and they're still, um, 
I need to go to Halifax. Uh, I need to, to, I'm trying to connect to some ancestor, uh, some descendants of these uh, enslaved that went here from Soderley. Um, went to Halifax from Soderley. I'm starting to make some connections, but to get the actual people who know the story and can connect with me. So I probably will end up having to go there if I really want to uh, and can be able to do that. Um, so James Bowie and Joseph Wood were two people that actually ended up in Trinidad. Um, I've had um, people come on a tour and said, oh, well, there was no slavery in the United Kingdom uh, during the War of 1812. Well, maybe on the island proper, but all their commonwealth territories um, still had slavery, including Trinidad. So when they got to Trinidad, they call them the Americans, and you can look that up. When they got to uh, Trinidad, uh, they, were, they were segregated from the enslaved African Americans and the, 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 the enslaved people at Trinidad and the, um, and uh, they, were, they were free. So they were segregated from the ones that were still enslaved when they got there. So awesome story. We know that um, uh, James Bowie was married. He had two children. Um, and when he died, uh, but that's another place we need to go visit, right? Um, some of this is a lifetime of work. Um, and I try to do a, a little at a time, but hey, nothing says you all can't help, right? Um, so if you ever go on a cruise or go to Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, look up some of these names and you'll see these names in your resource list on the Legacy of Slavery in Maryland MSA. So uh, when I explained this uh, part, how we discovered these stories, um, MSA figured out that we had a big story, so they sent people to the archives in England to uh, look for ships, English ships, their manifest, and that's some of, they found some of this. So uh, they've tried to put together a story. There's not a story for everybody, uh, but it's worth a look see. And it's a the legacy of slavery in Maryland. Um, the whole site on. MSA online is really good to look at for all different periods if you want to study uh, slavery in Maryland. So lots of resources. Um, so as I said, um, um, all of these people um, change leaving changed the face of Soderley really. It changed it was changed the course of its history. Of course, uh, slavery was still a part of our story until after emancipation in 1864. But it did cause um, a lot of financial havoc for the owners of these large plantations. So he's, uh, John Rouse, Rouseby Plater and his, and his nephew, the heir of Soderley, George Plater V, ended up started out with um you know 64 and enslaved and ended up with 16 14 or 16. that's a big difference you can't uh recover really recover very well from that and i can't say as john rouseby plater helped out much um and we know that george plater the uh fifth sold solidly to william clark somerville what was left of it uh, by 1822. And another sidebar is John Rouseby Plater and George Plater IV are listed on a manifest of a ship going from Baltimore to the Port of New Orleans uh, in 1823. And they're shipping enslaved children mainly and young people, mainly children four and five years old. John Rouseby, uh, uh, John Rouseby Plater Jr., which is John Rouseby Plater's son, who actually married George Plater, the fifth sister. That's a whole other story. 
Um, and uh, George Plater V was also on that manifest that he was shipping a 16-year-old mulatto girl named Darkie on the same passage. So the domestic slave trade going strong. Maryland was a supplier of bodies of enslaved people to the South. It was big money. So all of the owners during slavery did this. If they were not directly involved in the transatlantic slave trade, then they also were part of the domestic slave trade. So, uh, and, and uh, just to give you a note, um, Julia King, who is a, our, uh, an arche famous archeologist, anyway, she just did a survey, her and her people did a survey of Soderley and archeological survey and that survey report will probably come out later this summer but uh, she believes and her team believes that this area out here where are we think there's some former enslaved uh, enslaved and former enslaved buried out here all this whole hillside is covered with artifacts from slave dwellings during that time, during that War of 1812. So we're thinking it probably how some of these people we're talking about today. Um, so I, I just wanted to let you know that and go do some of your own story. It's fast, uh, own research. It's fascinating to find out. And uh, I'm getting sirens now. Um, don't know why uh, and it is raining I hope you guys can see uh, and I hope you guys could hear me fine uh, I am um, I am basically probably gonna sign off a little sooner today just because it's starting to rain a lot harder uh, and I don't uh, see the point what I well I'll do though is I think what I'm going to do is see you have to wing it here right always wing it at Soderley. I'm going to go into the barn and show you another exhibit. All my papers are sopping wet. But isn't this beautiful? Isn't this beautiful? So it is raining a little harder. So I'm going to go. There is also an exhibit and here's my car, so I'm behind the barn, as you know. Over there is where they did archaeology. And, you know, the, the you've seen the what we think is might be a grave site. So all of that, all of that will be, I'm sorry, that's my car. Um, that's the visitor center over there, just to give you some bearings. So I'm going to go into, pardon, pardon the mess, the barn is still, like has, it's not, it's not trashy, it just has equipment in it that, um, yeah, it's starting to rain hard now. So it just has equipment in it and from our last event, really, but it's cleaned up. Okay, this is the uh, kitchen, quote unquote, part. <laughs> it's a staging area, really. So, let me go in here. So this, I'm inside the barn, and you can see it's it's got some stuff in it from our last, um, let me get this right, it's from our last event, but this is inside the barn if you've never seen it. So we use this, like a speaker series that we had virtually, we would have done it live in here. We've had, we have lots of events in here, but I'm um, sorry for the chairs here, but I just wanted to show you. So this is a little exhibit here. You just got some little panels. It looks like it was also funded by Maryland Humanities, plug, plug. <laughs> so uh, this is a picture of Walter Barber. Some of you have seen some of these pictures before. And it talks about our farm. That's Mud Stevens there. Yes, um, uh, 
Jerome, I have I have a couple of questions from a couple of uh, descendants that I'm I promise I still have you in my queue and I'll get back to you. I promise. Um, the the, the uh, amount that you know we're, we're trying to get everything online and it's really hard. But and it seems like you get. Does it seem like you're working harder from home than you did it in your office? It it it, it kind of does to me. Because there's something to be said about leaving at the office, I think. When you're at home, it's like you just keep working. So there's Mud Stevens, and here down here is, uh, it says a, a team. Uh, these are a, a team of men um, working this saw. Now, that, there's a saw like that outside of the corn crib but that's what it is. It, it's, the motor's run by a tractor with a belt there. So that's cool. And I think this was put up too when, when they did the barn to accommodate events. That's Herbert Satterley up there uh, with Mabel and a friend, it looks like. And this is horses used. So they still did farming the old way in the early 20th century here. Okay. Doesn't say who that is. That's a, that's a prize to find an actual name on a photograph, let me tell you. I'll go home and mark all your pictures, will you? Your descendants will thank you later. Okay, uh, that's Ernest Knott and Walter Barber. So those are familiar names. So this is um, Walter Barber, and then um, Bernard Barber, and then, um, you know, the, those three generations of Barbers, Knots, uh, Scribers, and it, it gives a little uh, information about farming here. This was done a while. I think, I think... Um, um, Sheila uh, he, Hebert did this too. Uh, did, did this wording? If I'm if I'm correct, remembering right, you can correct me, Meredith, if I'm not right. But I think she did this wording also. It might be Meredith. I don't know. I wasn't here when this was done, so I have. I'm not a, not uh, not. I don't remember. Somebody told me one time. And there's our famous photograph of of uh, of the barn. I'm standing in the barn right now. This is facing out toward the road. But all these people working at Soderly and the horses. 1938. That's not been long ago, folks, really, in the scheme of things. And this is, uh, it says Robert Lee Kelly shears a sheep at Sodderly. Let me get, get that one for you. Do you see that one? So, um, you know, we, we try to find spaces anywhere we think people might gather. You know, that's a good place to put, uh, that's a good place to put a, um, put an exhibit, right? So I'm going to turn this back to me for a minute. If I can do the right thing here. And Hi. So you're going to see my, my stand that I had this on, too. Uh, so that'll block your picture a little bit. But, hi, I, I, it's not a good hair day <laughs> to be outside in the, uh, in the rain. But I, ho I hope that you got something out of this. And please go to the resource link that Catherine gave you. Um, and try not to spend all day on it, but you'll be tempted. Um, there's lots and lots of information. It just goes on and on. And not just about uh, St. Mary's County, but other counties and all of Maryland. The legacy of slavery in Maryland um, link there. Um, you can look up uh, 
you know, uh, you can look up owners, you can look up, um, there's ads, uh, slave runaway ads. There's, I mean, you name it, they got it. Um, primary documents, some of the documents we talked about today, you can go there and look at the original one uh, uh, on digital format. So um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will, uh, I always hope for good weather. Um, it was beautiful outside, even though it was, it was uh, sprinkling a little bit, and the wildlife's really going on. Uh, but I, but uh, I really appreciate you joining me and bearing with me when I have, when I have to, uh, you know, figure it out once I get here because it's never the same and it never stays the same during the whole, during the whole presentation too. So, uh, I always say I taught eighth grade. I can do, I can do it right. So, um, thank you so much, and I hope you have a good rest of your week. And I'll see you next week at uh, two o'clock on Thursday. Bye-bye, everybody.